Hello, everyone, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are. Welcome to another episode of Purpose, Planet, and Profit with Topple. Chris Georgian here again for our very exciting conversation in our ongoing series about really the intersection of ESG supply chain and logistics, all part of the Let's Talk Supply Chain family. For those of you joining from the Topple community, you're going to know this already, but for those of you who aren't, just want to say a few words about myself and Topple. I've personally been in the blockchain space going all the way back to 2012, 2013, and now in this very exciting intersection of deep technology and ESG social impact for the last five. Topple really prides itself as being an ecosystem for the types of companies that we've been talking to through this whole series and the two companies that are being represented here today. For us, it's all about, you know, maybe not doing the change directly ourselves, but enabling some of the amazing change that our guests are all bringing to the world. And so with that, I'm simply going to dive right in today and allow our guests to introduce themselves. Uh, these are two amazing top of partners that we've been working with over the last few weeks, months. It's It's been a while now, but they can introduce themselves far better than I can. Uh, Rob, would you like to would you like to start and kick us off today? Yeah, let me start by saying thanks for having me. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity and to be here. And we love Topple. Um, so I'm Rob Garrison. I'm the founder and CEO of Mercado. And Mercado is an import platform. And our, our primary mission is to connect and automate the global supply chain. So by way of background and how I came to this place, I, I've spent my whole career in international trade of some sort, uh, initially with an ocean carrier in Chicago. Then I worked for two large importers, uh, one Michaels in Dallas, Texas, and Kmart up in Troy, Michigan. And then I worked for two very large 3PLs, uh, FedEx and UPS. And so throughout that journey, I got to see the import supply chain from three different perspectives. And it's been a great career. I've been able to travel all over the world and go inside lots and lots of factories and inside the, the, the guts of some really significant supply chains on my career, like Apple and Target, et cetera. So I saw a problem that existed and still exists and decided that it was time to, to take a stab at fixing it. And so as we go through this uh, uh, podcast, I'll certainly, Chris, get into a little bit more uh, detail about the problem that we saw and how we resolve it. But that's me by way of background. And thank you again. Thank you, Rob. All right. Uh, Sydney, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you also for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I'm here calling in from Seattle, Washington, um, but that's by way of growing up in England, so that's why I don't sound like I'm from around here. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Public Habit. Public Habit is an on-demand knitwear production platform. So we work with factories overseas to produce everything in real time. We don't own any inventory. We receive customer orders, route them to our production partners and produce and turn around orders within about three weeks. Um, my background kind of within the same sphere as Rob, but much more so from the retail consumer end of, of, of the landscape of supply chain. I worked with very large retailers, both vertical and retailer with, between Ralph Lauren and then Amazon, really as in predominantly buying and inventory planning roles. And so my experience, honestly, I didn't know very much about what was going on behind the scenes. And it took until 2018 when I decided to venture out my own and see how hard it could really be to start my own t-shirt brand, which is my very first iteration of Public Habit, source my own product, figure out my own supply chain, that I really started to clue into just how complex and just how messy and just how backwards the supply chain can be. Um, so I'm excited to share some of what I learned today um, with you all, but um, also super excited about the products that your teams have built. Excellent. Sydney, Rob, thank you so much for uh, for those introductions. For everyone else, as always, we're going to try to keep this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, feel free to to send them over. We're going to incorporate them. This is you know really to uh, to expose or to highlight two you know two amazing companies doing a ton at the intersection again of 
ESG and supply chains. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. You know, just what is the potential of some of these new digital technologies, these digital platforms. Um, so kind of looking at the technology angle, but just also looking at, you know, some of the economics or some of the, the business relationships often involved in supply chain. And uh, that's actually what we're going to start with. Sydney Forbes has written that public habit is, you know, quote, flipping the script on supply chains. I'm guessing, and, you know, I kind of already know this, but probably everyone's guessing that that has something to do with what you said, three-week delivery times and just-in-time manufacturing. Can you explore that a little bit more for us, what that means and why it's impactful? Yes, I am very passionate about this space. So, um, you know, for those less familiar with the apparel supply chain or even probably those who may be somewhat familiar, it, it takes anywhere between about 12 to 18 months typically to kind of commercialize a new fashion product from I want to make this new sweater to seeing it in a store. And along that lead time, there are a lot of people that need to touch the product, a lot of people that need to contribute to how to make it from raw materials to design to planning production to logistics. I mean, you name it, there's is one of the most human intensive supply chains out there. And so one of the biggest issues within the supply chain is that by planning so far in advance, you end up making a hell of a lot more than you than you need and always are making too much of the wrong thing and less of the right thing. So this whole concept of supply chain pushing products to consumers has really created this huge overproduction problem that's amounted to over 50 billion garments every year that will end up in landfill that have just never even been sold. So it's upwards of about 30% of everything that's made in the apparel supply chain that never finds a customer. And that was the problem that I really wanted to tackle with public habit and flipping this around. So you listen to customers, you only make what they order, and you try and reverse this very, very messy, long, decades long um, supply chain that's been built and just isn't working for anyone anymore. Wow, thank you for that, Sydney. Uh, so 12 to 18 months, down to just three weeks. Uh, my math is a little bit rusty, but that's like a 95% uh, reduction from a, a sheer time perspective. I can see the business implications of that a little bit later on. I'm definitely going to want to touch further on the some of the ESG implications that you already got started on there. So, you know, thank you for that intro. One of the things that we touched on a little bit is that Public Habit is working with Mercado Labs. Rob, I would love to understand how that works essentially you know mercado is an you know an online import export platform what does that mean what is kind of your role in uh enabling these projects yes uh, thanks and the the fundamental challenge uh that that we saw in this market was that uh importers really aren't connected in any significant way to the people who make their products and i say people who make their products versus suppliers that's really key because it is people and it is products. And we sort of forget that, right? And so our notion was that if we could connect in a meaningful way, the importer to those people that make their products, we could make all kinds of changes. And at its simplest level, sort of a simple notion for everyone is when you think about importing, um, the products that you're selling online are completely automated, completely frictionless. You know, you and I order everything online and we get in our doorstep yeah. in five days. Yet when we turn on and buy that very same product, it's all offline and it takes five months or up to a year in Sydney's case in peril. Many, many people involved, many, many companies involved and that's all offline. So the simple notion was we'd like our customers to be able to buy their products the same way they sell them. So that was sort of the simple notion. And the way we do that is first we uh, digitize their order and we present it to their suppliers to make their products over the internet. So it's a pretty uh, simple connection. And then we automate many of those processes versus all the things that were being done manually uh, prior to that. And the focus for us at this time on our platform is to help them plan the product more efficiently, to buy it more efficiently, and to move it more efficiently. So that's basically uh, the problem we saw was a disconnected supply chain. The way we solve it is connecting it. And we expect all kinds of great outcomes to come from that, which we can talk about uh, a bit down the road. Oh, I, so I, I really like that idea of 
symmetry because you're absolutely right as consumers and as kind of that final uh, seller that we're interacting with, it's all online and we're kind of all very used to that. And I think, you know, it's not clear to a lot of us and a lot of people probably just don't know how different the rest of that supply chain looks like before it gets to that final seller and us. I think it might be really helpful because you mentioned kind of that transition from, from analog to digital. But if you can maybe paint the status quo a little bit. So the projects and the supply chains you're going into aren't digital yet. What are they? I mean, are papers being mailed around? Is it is it fax based? Is it phone calls? What, what are you going into here? Yes, it's every it, they're throwing everything at it, but it's everything non-digital, unfortunately. So it's it's a combination of you name it, WhatsApp, WeChat, uh, Excel, PDF, email. But maybe it's best, Chris, if I under, uh, explain the fundamental problem that that created this. Yeah, please. Uh, you say rusty supply chain. So. In fairness to the importers, they have really good systems to manage that demand. When you're buying stuff, they've got an arsenal of tools to manage that demand. And central to that is their system of record, which is an ERP, where all the financials are kept. So as they sell stuff, obviously, they start to figure out that they're going to need more of it. And a lot of that planning is done and the financials are planned in their ERP. And that's where they raise their purchase order. So they're going to create a purchase order and say, I need you know, 50,000 more units to replenish everything that we're selling. And it's not going to be here for five months. So I've got to think a little bit about what's going to happen five months from now. So, so far, so good. The problem is that when they raise that purchase order in their ERP, typically in their ERP, uh, and they want to present it to the supplier, the supplier doesn't have any system with which to receive it. So right there is the fundamental problem is that they wind up having to email it to the supplier as a PDF. And so from that point forward, that one year that Sydney's talking about in apparel or five months and other products or three months and other products, the supplier who's making the products and the importer are forced to go back and forth via all these methods, email, Excel, et cetera. And so you can imagine just that alone is obviously doesn't make any sense. But when you start to think about how many people are involved, there's there's up to 30 people involved in a purchase order. There's 15 different entities that have to come together to get a purchase order from plan to deliver um and all of the complexity of the data the the shipment level the purchase order level the product level it's just kind of insane when you think about it that that's not managed with a modern platform and so it just didn't exist and so we, like i said we were a little bit crazy and thought well let's build it and so that <laughs> that's that's what we that's what we aim to do so, so that makes a lot of sense and i think that's really helpful context so really what you're getting at is even those companies that are digital internally they have nice streamlined systems that nice streamlined system doesn't break out of their own boundaries very well in the sense that like when i'm trying to communicate or when i'm trying to go back and forth i have to leave my nice pretty internal digital system and flip to email flip to phone calls and uh just sending things back and forth yeah well said and you know just those tools in and of themselves you know nobody is going to say excel is not a good tool or email is not a good tool they just weren't designed for something like this and then when you add in, there's some additional complexities you have to add in besides all those ones that I described. You're talking to somebody who's 8,000 miles away that you've possibly never met. And in the last two years, haven't been able to go visit, right? And there's cultural differences or language barriers. Uh, there's even di differences in how people describe things within the supply chain. So the tools aren't, aren't built for this. They certainly can't keep up with this. It's massively complex to begin with. And then you've got these additional challenges that you've got to face. So really when i started to think about it this way when we were starting to build a business chris i thought you know this is just, really just crazy now in fairness to everybody it wasn't that people were crazy our other big insight was that technology had progressed to the point where when we built something like this we could build it in a way that it was easy and affordable to use because hmm. there have been systems in the past that have have made some headway in this space uh, and the issue was the years that they were built, 1988 and 1998, respectively, had 1988 and 1998 technologies. And so these ex systems were very expensive and very difficult to deploy. And the expression was you had to force people to use them. Well, that's crazy. That's never going to work if we have to force people to use stuff. And it's no, difficult. Never it'll never work. So with modern technology, we like to say, we don't want to force anybody to use anything. We want them to say, this is a way better way to do it. And we want to join this ecosystem. So that was the notion that we built it. Yeah. So so joining that ecosystem, you know, that idea of joining into an ecosystem. Um, I want to highlight that because we actually have a question from the chat here. 
uh, from Rakesh. Thank you for that. This seems like fundamentally there's like an interface problem that if I have one system and you have another system and we're trying to communicate, there's an interface in the middle. And if that interface doesn't communicate, we're not communicating. So on the platform that you've developed, is is it kind of the case that I have my sellers and my buyers all on that same platform? And so that Mercado integrates with each group's ERP, and then it's kind of forming the interface to allow that communication to go back and forth? Or how are you guys kind of solving that um, interface issue? Yeah, I think I think that's worth well said. Now, just get into a little bit more specificity in terms of how it works. So when we take that purchase order from the customers, from the importers ERP, we digitize it. When we present it to the supplier, we're presenting it over to the web. So they register, we train them. It takes about 30 minutes to train. And then the first purchase order comes through and they click on it. And then essentially our software is the purchase order. So all of the activities that you would do to manage a purchase order are on our platform. So production monitoring, change control, communication, document creation, all of those things are basically what our software does. And then when the production is complete, we make the electronic handoff to the 3PL that moves the product. Mm -hmm. And we create the documents, make the electronic handshake, and then we interface with the 3PL to track the product all the way through delivery. So we've essentially just connected all those parties that had to do all of those activities onto a platform. Much of the work can be done there. And then where there's interfaces, we can still get the information the importer needs to manage their supply chain. All right. So that, that makes sense. We, we have an interface problem and then we have a platform that can be holistic, can be integrated to, you know, basically bridge that gap. That, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And I think that idea of being able to increase the efficiency, decrease the time of communication is, you know, critical. We've all seen over the last year or so how much stress our supply chains are under, even the current model of supply chains. Oh. Sydney, moving from like 12 months or 12 or 18 months down to weeks, I imagine you have even more sensitivity around your communication back and forth and things like that. You know, tell me how how important is that almost real time communication to meeting a three week uh, manufacturer uh, timeline? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, we batch our orders twice a week to our suppliers overseas as opposed to maybe an more traditional apparel company that may be placing well these days it moves so quickly that you're still probably dealing with fashion companies that are placing orders weekly so it's it's not necessarily quite that you know quite as um vastly different from how quickly the market is moving anyway the benefit being that we are we built we are building this based on demand as opposed to trying to react to something that we need to sell a year from now knowing that the delivery can actually happen in three weeks so for us the real-time communication is absolutely critical and it's critical for pretty much everyone and then in as a buyer in a buyer's capacity and um, you know everything that that rob mentioned from time lost working with overseas suppliers to just the the thread and the train of documents that you're trying to manage to move back and forth between between parties is really 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 complex so having a tool like Mercado where we can centralize and document all of that in real time, and that is basically plugged in with our Shopify site, which is kind of the next phase of where Mercado mm -hmm. is going to be able to take their product, is an enormous asset for us to be able to connect our point of sale directly with our production, which is such a powerful concept for it's us. Pretty much all the way then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I can definitely see how Again, with, with such a time reduction, that sort of efficiency is is absolutely necessary. I think a lot, I think one of the big trends, and I kind of want to highlight this that we've seen in uh, apparel and fashion supply chains over the last few years is this idea of fast fashion, right? The fact that um, I'm getting new clothes, it's very very seasonal, it's very affordable, but I'm guessing that probably creates a bit of a waste problem, probably a bit of a waste problem in addition to things just being thrown out. I'd love to just dive into, you know, some of the ESG side of what you're doing a little bit more. You know, how did you get inspired to do this model? How did you come up with all the research and the numbers to understand just how much of an impact uh, kind of this model could have? I'd love to understand yeah. that story a bit more. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, there are so many aspects of the apparel industry that need to change. And I think everyone is fortunately really, really plugged into trying to tackle these things. I, I'm, I'll be curious to see if we can do it at the rate that we need to, to really reverse some of the environmental impact that that the industry has created. I, I, I would highlight kind of historically how we got here. Um, one of the biggest um, directions of the apparel supply chain, and this isn't dissimilar to the rest of the supply chain, is that um, over time, as we started moving production overseas, we've been chasing the lowest cost sourcing model, which really means that we're looking to make the most that we can for the cheapest cost possible um, so that we can try and manage our margins based on on product cost. And mm. the issue with that model is that in order for that to make any sense for a supplier, they need a really big order. And so they need to make 50,000, 100,000 pieces in Bangladesh for them to be able to produce a t-shirt for five cents. And that is where we've created this enormous overproduction problem of having to make much, much more than we need in order to manage these profitability goals that we're trying to hit by mm. producing for the lowest cost possible. The issue with this, however, is that, you know, financially what, we're, what we end up with is an enormous markdown budget that we end up losing a lot of margin at the end of the season anyway. So it actually hasn't worked out for us anyway. We have as I mentioned, upwards of 30% that will never be sold at the end of the season, that you're just eating a margin and will ultimately either mark down or liquidate or will end up in landfills. And so this lowest cost sourcing model just doesn't work and doesn't make sense. Um, so what for me as a, as a small business getting started, it was much more practical than that. It was Supply, talking to suppliers who all, all wanted me to produce a thousand pieces of something that I didn't know I was going to sell. I'm like, why would I do that? I don't want to be left with potentially 500 pieces that I don't know what to do with. And, and having and to mark down and lose money at the exactly, end. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This is just not a financially savvy thing to do. I'd much prefer to make 50 of them, test it out and see how it does and then go in for a bigger order. Mm -hmm. So it really started with trying to find suppliers that were able to work in a more on-demand small batch capacity. And what I found was that some of the Chinese manufacturers had already figured this out. They were already figuring out how to manage a more nimble supply chain themselves mm -hmm. by either going direct to consumer from the factory or by actually investing in machinery that made on-demand production possible oh, yeah. and economically viable. Um, and so that was really the journey. It was really around tackling over production, but with that has obviously come an enormous you know, litany of other ESG issues that, um, you know, was just probably not enough time to talk about. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that though, Sydney. And it's always something that, you know, we try to highlight or that Topple, you know, always tries to partner with whenever we can find those areas where, you know, we're driving positive ESG outcomes in a way that's like actually sustainable and doesn't rely on, you know, grants or philanthropy or something like that. If we can get, if we can, be really creative, really innovative, and have things that make business sense at the same time doing something positive, you know, we think that's where the real game changers lie because those are sustainable. Those can those can grow, those can grow the company, those can, you know, convince other companies that it's the right way to go. And um, it's a big problem. And I think these things need to be tackled sustainably. And they also need to be tackled uh, scalably. So Rob, I actually want to jump to the chat again, because one big piece of scalability for, you know, a platform like yours is how easy is it to use? If I'm looking to to use this software, you know, maybe you could tell me a little bit about that. You know, am I am I buying licenses? Is it SaaS based? Feels like everything is SaaS based nowadays, but uh, maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, happy to. I just want to uh, mention one thing just to, to dovetail on what Sydney said, because yeah. you know, one, of, one of the many re reasons that I love partnering with um, Sydney and her company is she just took a fresh look at this thing, right? And so a lot of times you say, what would you do if you had a blank sheet of paper? Or And they call it first principles. And so the notion that you came into the business and looked at it and said, <laughs> why do we do things this way? is really refreshing, right? Because for so long, 30 years, um, it's been done the same way. And one thing I'll say about that, just to give everybody a feel for the size of this industry, because like you said at the top of this call, Chris, you know, you don't really think that much about the imports. You, you buy them, but you don't really think about where they came from. 
massive industry. It's $2.5 trillion worth of purchasing that we make annually as Americans from abroad. And that number represents 15% of the U.S. gross domestic product. 15%. It's one of the largest segments of gross domestic product. So it's massive. So just the, the fact that we were doing it that way is a little crazy. So I just wanted to put an exclamation point on Sydney kind of saying, this is crazy. It's <laughs> <laughs> from a fresh perspective. That's all you would say. Now, if you've been doing it for a long time, it's kind of that's the way we've done it, right? Because that's um, the way we've done it. And no question. We've always done. So we'll just, let's keep doing it that way, right? <laughs> um, and, and let's get, you know, more people and get and work harder. So the, the answer to the question, um, and thanks for that is yeah we are a SaaS model this just became part of how do we make everything easier so how do we make it easier for suppliers for importers for 3pls to interface and so we thought a lot about that across the board and one of which was how do we price this thing and SaaS, as you know became the predominant model largely because it doesn't require an upfront investment doesn't require hosting and so you can really consume this on a monthly basis at an affordable price point. So it, it really, that was the primary driver for SaaS is we just want to make it simple for people to understand and have transparent pricing and be able to consume it affordably. Cause that wasn't, that's another piece of this thing. If it's not affordable, um, you know, what's the point? So, so that that's the model, B2B SaaS. It makes all the sense in the world. I think there's, you know, probably a lot of strong arguments and, you know, you just made a lot of them why like I said, it seems like everything is, uh, everything is SaaS nowadays. Yeah. Um, all right. So before we kind of uh, get to wrap up, because I both I know both of you have, you know, some exciting news, some exciting things on the horizon that uh, that we're going to make that we're going to want to make sure to highlight. Robert, if we can pivot to blockchain really quick. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Mercado and Topple are working together from the perspective of, you know, they have a technology solution. We have kind of a bit of an underlying technology solution. And I'd love to dive in for a moment on just how a platform like Mercado is working with blockchain technology or even working with other new and exciting technologies. And, you know, building things is always hard. Why explore a new technology uh, like this, Rob? Yeah, yeah. I think the, the better question in this case, specifically with blockchain, is why not? It's really a great solution for it. Love that. To do here. And so I, but I, I just give a, a little bit of a background in this before I get to blockchain, because blockchain is a really key piece of this. But before we get there, you know, so our premise was that there's a lot of big problems that we've talked about with the way the current methodology. And so, you know, the four big things we solve, we, we hope that we can help customers increase sales because now we're tying the disposition of their product and the DNA of their order directly to their sales. So that's mm -hmm. sort of number one. There's a lot of things that can't occur with operational excellence until you're both on the same platform. But the third one, well, the fourth one is resiliency, but I won't touch too much on that. But the third one is ESG, which is where I'll go with blockchain. And so when you think about, well, how do I solve for environmental social governance? How do I solve for that? And it's a big topic right now. We as Mercado knew that we could get people part the way there. And we do that essentially. Uh, one way we do it is that we do training and validation for the suppliers. And so, you know, training them on all of the different requirements relative to social, whether it's California Supply Chain Transparency Act or mineral conflict or child labor. You want to make sure that your suppliers got a good chance of understanding what's required for them to be compliant, to make the world a better place. And you don't want to not trust them, but you want to have some testing in there to, to make sure that you know that they really do understand it and that they can prove competency. And then the other sort of even more basic thing is that um, you want to be connected to them in some meaningful way so that you've got some level of transparency or some type of a lens into what their operations look like. So those two things go as a starting point, as a building block to how do we get to ESG? First, we have to have a lens into the supply base and yep. the products they're making and so forth. Secondly, we've got to give them a fighting shot with some education and some, some certification. But at the end of the day, and I hate to be cynical, People can game the system and they do, you know, so yep. so we can certainly say that we we took that test. But I don't know that somebody else took the test. I, and again, I hate to be cynical, but I've just been doing this a long time and I've seen all kinds of different methodologies of sort of saying I do one thing, wink, wink and doing something else. And so when I looked at blockchain, I thought, well, this is the first time maybe that we can actually prove a claim. And mm -hmm. so if Sydney wants to make a claim that her supplier, in fact, did, you know, ship one shipment, didn't do it in bulk and then break it out. 
that's a claim that that supplier is making. And there's some things that I can do on my platform to help her validate that claim. But again, there's ways that that supplier, if they wanted to, could work right around my systems. With blockchain, we can attach a blockchain to it and then provide sort of immutable verification of that claim. Because the blockchains, there's nobody that can game a blockchain, it's a system. Mm -hmm. And so when I first met, um, and I'll just be honest about blockchain, I, I had a sort of a different opinion of it until I met Topple because just the firepower required to solve some of these claims was was immense. And I thought, wow, there's a lot of firepower. And when I heard about Topple's blockchain as a service where you're going to tame some of that beast behind the scenes and deliver up what I need in sort of more manageable chunks, that was the final piece for me to say, ah, oh, well, finally, finally, maybe we really can tackle, tackle this ESG issue. And we really can help to make the world a better place. We've, we've, my mission, my personal mission was to shine bright lights in dark corners because I've had a great career, as I mentioned, but I've seen a lot of bad stuff. And But I always knew in the back of my head, I could only get halfway there with what I could do. And I was hopeful that there was more technology that's going to come along to take us the rest of the way there. And so I'm really excited about this partnership. But um, I'm not a blockchain expert, but I certainly understand the power of being able to validate a claim immutably because there's not a human in the process that can uh, interrupt that mm -hmm. pattern and somehow gain it. Yeah. No. And if uh, oh, I yes, on to that, I just, um, because I'm, you know, newly getting familiar with the applications of blockchain for apparel specifically. And I think it, you know, when we think about how we were auditing our supply chains in the past, one of the more effective ways of doing that was really in-person visits, like really yeah. getting to know your suppliers, that face-to-face -face interaction that, you know, a third party audit only does so much. It's um, yep. a, a part of it, but again, not an immutable thing. It's people talking to people. And we're living in a world where it's very hard to move around the world freely. And we've got to figure out better ways to bring more traceability and transparency to these supply chains. And that's what gets me super excited about blockchain and the, the capacity of it to bring, you know, to try and just right size this greenwashing that's been happening in in the apparel industry for a number one but there's it's, it's across the board so i think it's an incredibly powerful tool yeah no i think you both hit on you know, really excellent points you know just like we had a way of doing supply chains previously that you know technology can be disrupting we also had ways of doing uh verification and certification that can absolutely be improved and you know i think it's really interesting how many trends or um you know patterns the pandemic really exacerbated but i think it when we couldn't fly everywhere anymore for a few months i think it really highlighted it's like ooh, is, is there a better way that i can uh get these insights is there a better way that i can have uh to rob's point you know lights shown in dark corners because i can't do the thing i was uh I was always so accustomed to uh, to do previously. So, yeah, that's definitely how we're looking at it. You know, Rob, to your point about making your platform as a service to make it easier, you know, blockchain is hard. Blockchain is confusing for a lot of people. So we followed a very similar pattern to you said, how can we make it as as easy as possible so you can include it and then eventually kind of pass that service along to uh, kind of those end users like uh, Sydney and Public Habit who are like actually having that direct impact in the supply chain. So kind of like a, a cake or a layered sandwich that we're building here. But uh, I think it's a very exciting one. So uh, as we uh, as we get to the end, the three of us will actually all be together at, uh, at NRF to be highlighting some of this work early next year. But I'm going to throw it to both of you if there are any projects, any exciting developments that we want to take a few minutes to uh, to focus on at the end? What is, Sydney, we're going to start with you. What's next for public habit? Well, I think I was, just the way that you phrased that last point about, you know, some of your mission behind Topple and Mercado of being able to, to open up solutions to make it easy, make it easier, try and just um, bring some simplicity to a very complex industry. I think what I've also found is this enormous opportunity to simplify the apparel production industry. So mm -hmm. what Topple is doing and what Mercado is doing are very important pieces in, in this thread, but where, where I see the real impact for 
where public habit will go is an open source kind of SaaS platform to help brands bring product to market more efficiently, more quickly, and with much more transparency. So that's kind of the next phase for public habit is really bringing the tools together to be able to bring some of what I've learned and built from a supply chain standpoint for public habit to a much broader audience of brands and creators. Oh, I love that idea. I, I the, the idea that not only is there more efficiency, but then that model can be almost productized and made accessible to, as you said, you know, creators, young designers and things like that. And just like tearing down those barriers as much as possible to say, mm -hmm. you know, you have an idea, you have a vision, there are people that are interested in it. How can I make yeah. that connection as easy as possible? Yeah, better matching supply and demand in the right way. And so the power has shifted to be more in the hands of kind of the creators and the suppliers, because I think today a lot of our suppliers don't hold any power in this, and yet they're so critical in our supply chain. So it's really trying to democratize that that whole relationship through the supply chain. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I mean, I think it's something that you obviously see in apparel. I think we see it in a lot of supply chains, whether they're they're minerals and we're dealing with, uh, you know, miners or farmers or, you know, some of the creators and textile producers in your case, shifting those power dynamics is, uh, you know, we, we talked about waste in the ESG uh, context earlier, but, you know, shifting some of those power dynamics will absolutely be um, just as big of an impact. And so yeah. that's super exciting. Thank you for, uh, for giving us a, a peek into that. Really appreciate it. Watch the uh, space. <laughs> Definitely. Rob, anything uh, anything that you want to highlight before uh, we kind of wrap up? Yeah, real quick. I, I, I just, well, again, I want to sort of put an exclamation point on what Sydney said, because for me, who's been doing this forever, and I've just got kind of accustomed to the complexity and sort of learned to work through it and learned to speak uh, the Swahili that we speak to manage through it, it's, it's almost mind-blowing to think, well, what if it wasn't? <laughs> what if we just did it different? And we saw that transition in the final mile. I think hopefully we're going to see it in the first mile as well. So for us, the name Mercado means marketplace. And it was always our vision that over time, as we built our platform and connected these supply chains, we hoped that there would be an ecosystem that grew up around it. And so our vision was Mercado marketplace, where we could partner with people in different ways to create unique solutions. And so my real announcement is this, to me, represents exactly the next phase of our vision to be able to take what we do as a platform and couple it with really innovative technologies like yours, um, Chris, and then work on behalf of really anybody in the supply chain to see if we can create a better outcome. So we'll do certain functions and we can improve certain things and that's good. But if we can partner with people, there's sort, sort of almost an endless um, uh, opportunity to stay relevant if you're an importer in terms of taking advantage of these technologies. And it's happening so fast. I, I really hadn't seen an innovation in this space for about 25 years, frankly, since containers almost. Wow. And now, now it's all of a sudden, every time I turn around, there's another company solving a really vexing problem in this space. And so it's just so exciting for me to be a partner with those people on behalf of um, trade to be able to do things really so significantly better and differently than we did them in the past. So that's, so to me, that's my announcement. The marketplace is finally happening. Awesome. Well, the, the vision for the future that the two of you are painting is, is definitely exciting. If people want to, uh, to reach out, to follow up with either of you, how do they get in? Uh, what's the best way to get in contact? Rob? Yeah. yeah you, email for me is still my default. And I know that sounds old fashioned, but international trade, if you don't do email, you're, uh, you're, you're out of it. So Rob Garrison at MercadoLabs.com. And of course, our website is MercadoLabs.com. And I'd love to hear from you. So reach out to me anytime, please. Awesome. It's not that antiquated. At least you didn't give us a fax number. So that's a good <laughs> Good point. Yeah. I used to have one. So yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> uh, and Sydney, how can people get in touch with Public Habit? Email works as well. I'm Sydney at publichabit.com. And yeah, I definitely encourage you to check out our website, publichabit.com. Follow us on Instagram, Public Habit. Um, and that's probably where we'll be sharing more about what's to come. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited for that. Everyone else, thank you so much for uh, for joining today. This is a conversation that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. So really appreciate everyone tuning in with us. We'll be back next month for uh, for keeping the conversation going.
Thanks again, everyone, and thanks, thanks to our guests. This was a thank lot of fun. Thank you. Bye, everyone.